guess over the years I've had a couple of careers. My career in law came by going to law school and then practicing law. Uh, I was then appointed to the uh, to the bench in Orange County, California, and then left early to start uh, my private mediation and arbitration business. So I got started by getting a collection of ideas and then putting them uh, into practice. The service is basically providing private arbitration and mediation for dispute resolution. And the notion that uh, that could be made a business came to me after a series of events um, while I was um, assistant presiding judge of Orange County Superior Court. The um, civil lawyers were growing increasingly impatient because they could not get cases to trial because criminal cases have priority over civil cases. The right to a speedy and public trial guaranteed by the Constitution trumps any civil trial. So if there are a limited number of courtrooms, um, the criminal cases go first. So um, as part of a program that uh, presiding judge and I created. We started out with doing uh, settlement conferences by getting the attorneys together in every single civil case that was on file in Superior Court, um, excluding divorces and excluding probate matters, because they pretty much have to go. But at any rate, uh, we found that in the uh, in the settlement week program that we created, that we were able to resolve uh, a great many of the cases. And um, while we knew that 95% of all cases resolved before trial, we were encouraged by the fact that so many could be resolved well in advance of the courthouse steps, which is the usual place for resolution, or it used to be then. So the notion that um, lawyers needed a private and quiet place to come and sit down and discuss possible resolution of their cases was the first light bulb, I guess, that, that went on in my head. And um, of necessity, time was a great enemy at court because you could not spend all the time that you would like to discuss a case. And um, so I thought if we had plenty of time to dedicate to resolution of a case, it would be helpful. It's to help um, folks resolve differences outside the normal courthouse system. And um, we uh, like to say we do well by doing good is kind of our motto. The quote, others in our field are all local. In other words, we have offices throughout the United States. In each jurisdiction in which we have an office, there are individuals and sometimes groups of individuals doing this kind of arbitration and mediation work. But there's no single organization that has nationwide presence. So our competition is always at a local level. And what sets us apart, I think, is the quality of our service. And that's twofold, quality of our panel members who actually hear the cases, and probably equally, if not more important, quality of the staff to administer and set up and keep track of our 
cases and our facilities. We have hearing facilities in each of our resolution centers. So we offer outstanding panel members staffed by really, truly outstanding staff in really nice quarters. So that's what gives us the competitive advantage. In any jurisdiction, if you speak with trial lawyers and ask them the question, who would you rather, A, try a case in front of, and B, go to for settlement discussions, they will have a very short list of individuals. They have their favorites. So by simply making inquiry of the local bar members, we can fairly quickly find out who are the folks that are most respected in their ability to try cases and resolve cases. They're not always the same. Some judges are much better at sitting down and discussing uh, how to resolve a case and how to mediate a case. Others would just as soon try a case and not worry about settlement discussions. Likewise, the attorneys that we have on our staff, uh, by inquiring of the bar members in any community, you can find out fairly quickly who are the attorneys that are outstanding in the field of trying or resolving cases. And so it's the inquiry at the uh, local level, um, and then bringing on a good person, and then having that person help us get the next person, and so forth. Well, to begin with, there was just me and um, one assistant, and um, a golden retriever that came to to work with me every day. So our financial needs were fairly modest. And uh, I was able to borrow uh, some money from the bank to uh, pay the rent. Our first office was a 1,500 square foot office and one uh, employee. And um, a um, truly wonderful wife who was working hard to support the both of us. So uh, that's what started, was a loan from the bank. As time progressed and we grew larger and larger, then we had to go to different steps for financing. But the initial financing simply came as a loan from the bank. I think the idea, the concept, is something that is unique to the individual or the collection of individuals. A new idea to do something or as um, the founder of Heinz Food Company, the 57 varieties, once said, to do a common thing uncommonly well brings success. So. If you can do a common thing uncommonly well, or you've got a unique idea or concept as to how to provide a product or a service, that's what forms the nucleus. Generally speaking, I have seen that the person or persons who have that quality do not have the quality to then make it blossom and go into full fruition. Um, they have unique qualities of their own, but when good management skills, good accounting skills are brought to, to bear on the concept, then it flourishes. So in my mind, you have to be not only the idea person, but don't let your ego make you think that you're the be-all and the end-all. 
of the whole process. You need help. You cannot be all things to all people, at least in my case. And I've found that very few people can be all things um, because as the business grows, um, the demands are stacked higher and higher and higher. And you cannot attend to all of them and do them well. Yeah, you do well to remain with the concept, as a matter of fact. I did not feel I had strengths in any one area. Um, the strength that I did have was the ability to quickly figure out I did not have the strengths and to get others in to help me on our first round of, of financing after the firm had gotten large enough to warrant expansion. I hired a business person to manage the company or CEO or president, uh, an IT person and an accountant. Those were the first three people that um, that I reached out to, to to help run the business. I think it's important that the founder or the concept person or group set the tone or what do you want the company, how do you want it to relate to people? What spirit do you want the company to carry forward? What feelings do you want to create amongst the employees? What feelings do you want to create between the client and the service provider? Uh, and so the guidance that the founders or the entrepreneur gives to the organization are the most important. What spirit, what heart? What motivations, what, what do you want the firm to look like to the public and to each other? Um, and I think that's the, the primary thing that you can give is soul, give soul to the, to the organization. By never forgetting that your business's face to the public is your employees or your associates. Uh, you can't be all things to all people. Therefore, what you are and what you represent in your spirit and your soul has to be put out there by others. And you have to instill in them what you want put out to the public and never assume that they're going to do it the right way. Um, but assume if you got a person of character that meshes with yours that they can be taught what you want and how to do it. And they'll pick it up on their own and create an atmosphere that's fun to work in and fun for the clients. Uh, to, to um, Not fun, but enjoyable. It's an enjoyable experience. Nobody involved in a lawsuit thinks it's fun. And so um, I was mistaken in, in calling it that. But um, the employees, we run a, um, a satisfaction survey now in our firm once every other year of what do you think of the panel, uh, you the client, what do you think of the panel, what do you think of the employees, and then amongst the employees, what do you think of each other, what do you think of management, and then of the panel, what do you think of each other, and what do you think of the firm. And it's all done by an independent outside firm that uh, interviews fairly much in depth, uh, a statistical cross-section. And we have found that um, 
that our firm rates oh, as high as anybody on the, the relationship amongst the em employees. So um, they generally are very happy and we've used that tool to find out where they're unhappy and to modify their jobs so as to take away the friction or take away the stress if it's at all possible to do so. Some jobs are stressful and can't be changed, but the schedule can be changed or the approach can be changed. And so we've used the satisfaction survey uh, as a tool to make sure that the employees and the um, panel members are um, are at least taken care of to the best of our ability. You know, that's interesting because keep in mind I started 30 years ago. There was, I didn't have um, anything but a typewriter and a telephone at that time. Um, truly no offices had, uh, I mean that, it's interesting, I guess most of our employees were not even born when I started the company. So when I first started, um, there were no computers available. Uh, and um, fax machines had just barely begun to be something that was in an office. And, uh, and then as time went by, um, Obviously, it changed, and today, uh, a great portion of our communication is done over the internet. And you have to be careful that you're not overdoing it. That um, to call a meeting for the sheer hell of calling a meeting uh, is a great temptation sometimes, because. One person thinks they've got a great idea that they've got to disseminate, and that takes away from everybody's time. So uh, the ability to communicate has grown so great that it now has to be monitored um, and not overdone. Otherwise, it takes away from the work product itself. The answer is yes, but they might be, I, when we say cultural, I think we've got to define the, what we mean. Um, we have offices in Boston, and we have offices in Dallas. And as you may imagine, folks in Dallas do things a lot differently than they do in uh, Boston. The firm was founded in Southern California. Folks back east initially, I'm sure, had the impression that what we did is sit around in hot tubs, drinking wine, and discussing lawsuits. What if they know how to resolve cases? Because they teach how to do that back at the universities in the Ivy Leagues. So yes, there were cultural differences. Um, there were huge cultural differences as we went from one jurisdiction to the other. Uh, California was much more accepting of the concept of alternative dispute resolution than was, for example, New York City. Um, so what we've done in each jurisdiction is try to find the best people locally and imbue in them the spirit and soul of our company and then let them do the execution of it in their own backyard. As we are going overseas now and making affiliations with overseas groups, there is a great wariness over the whole American judicial system in Europe and in, in Asia especially. 
once they've gotten over the fact that what we're trying to do is resolve cases outside of that system and do it in a more Marcos Queensberry type of atmosphere, then we become more and more accepted. So the way we've overcome cultural differences is by enlisting the local person and having that person or persons be the pilots, if you will, as to how to navigate the treacherous waters of that particular area. Getting the notion of private dispute resolution accepted within the legal community, wherever we may go, in any jurisdiction within the United States. The general rule holds true that of 100 civil cases, 95 to 97 will resolve before they go to court. The last 3 to 5 percent then are the ones that go to trial. And they go to trial because there's something aberrant or unusual about the case um, that can't be resolved. So if 95% of the cases resolve, why should you pay money to resolve it early? Or why should you pay money to go to somebody independent to resolve it, why not go over to the courthouse and see if they can't help you? So the biggest obstacle that we had was to get the notion across that it was okay to resolve differences by sitting down and talking about them. It's been a rock at a time. Um, and I think it's been done through the personality and perseverance of both employees and panelists at a very local level. Um, it's a matter of word of mouth. If one person is satisfied with the experience. They'll tell the next person, and that person will tell the next person. And I think that's true in any service organization, whether it's be medicine or accounting or law or whatever it is. It's the satisfaction of one client exposed to the next one, exposed to the next one. And you can only keep that up so long as the service that you render is outstanding. And the only way to make that service outstanding is to have the face of the company reflected in the face of all the employees. Because they're, and I'm talking about from the person who answers the telephone to the CEO, nobody sees the CEO. Everybody sees the reception. Uh, so, from perhaps the most humble of positions to the most exalted of positions, you've got to have outstanding folks that are telling the community what a great place this is to work and what a great service we have to offer. And you have to have panel members who are providing the service that the people want, because they're not going to come back and pay good money to, to go through this the second time if it wasn't a good experience the first. That's not saying that any experience with a lawsuit is not a happy one for the parties on either side, but if it can be resolved and put behind them, uh, the, the satisfaction is there especially in the business community. Business men and women can deal with any kind of problem. What they can't deal with is uncertainty. Having this darn thing over their head for five years 
wondering how much do we reserve? What's the impact going to be? The unknown. They can't deal with unknowns. So if you can take away the unknowns and help them resolve, put it behind them, then you will have done your job. The CEOs have all had MBAs. They bring an analytical ability that um, I don't think lawyers are possessed of. They bring um, concepts and ideas of, of how to um, deal with people, how to deal with the HR folks. Uh, they, um, this whole concept of um, client satisfaction that I spoke to you about earlier uh, was something that was brought to us by the MBA. Um, how to structure fees, how to structure compensation, how to um, run the accounting system, all of these things. Um, the nuts and bolts of how to run a business is what they've brought to us in addition to broaden our concept and to broaden our view of what it is we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, I think entrepreneurs and, well, in our case, lawyers, tend to have fairly narrow focus. And the business community can bring an expansion to an organization that they've learned through their MBA program that we're not possessed of. We can learn and say, wow, that's a pretty easy idea. Why didn't we think of that? But that's what we continually find ourselves doing. Why didn't we think of that? Well, if you're so damn smart, you would have thought of it. But they have brought it to the table and, and made it work. I see it right now in um, marketing in our um, organization. The um, person who's in charge of it has um, got an MBA and a law degree and um, is doing an incredible job by bringing just outside thoughts, ideas, concepts, and as well as controls. and and um, how to administer things, um, how to structure the organization. There's just so many things that they have brought to us. I mean, now it seems almost second like nature. We've got this big organization that runs well, runs smoothly. But when you stop and reflect on how did it get there, well, we shot ourselves in the foot many times before it got there. But it was through good, business focus that got us there. Being able to expand the concept that it's okay to sit down and resolve disputes outside the, the court system. To be able to be a part of that ever-expanding um, field. It's being taught in all the major law schools now. Not that I had anything to do with it, but it is now being part of the legal community. And to have played a role in that is very satisfying. And then second, the private foundation that we founded it collects money and distributes it um, from home within our own organization. It's totally funded by panelists and employees of the company giving back to the community. And there's two groups within that. Uh, one of them is the um, so-called Jam Society, which is employees primarily giving back of their time, uh, not so much of money, but of their time to the community and to community efforts in each of the jurisdictions. And then the the James Foundation, members of the panel, give a percentage of their income to the foundation.
and then the foundation has a board and a director that oversees the distribution of the funds uh, to various in individuals and communities. So those are the, the things that I think that I'm most proud of. I would not make the effort to obtain financing with the notion that I was going to go public uh, until way far down the line. And I'm not sure I would ever do it in a service business. Um, I think that um, growth within, within the firm itself or by borrowing and paying it back is the way to do it. And I made that mistake of trying to do it through uh, the notion of, of getting funds and using those funds to expand with an idea that we would someday go public. That didn't work. And uh, so I would do that differently. Because we've made great strides by just expanding off of normal income. Just never think you're that good. Uh, you, can, you can be master of your ideas, but you can't be master of all your survey.